In this module, we will be discussing the services trade provisions in free trade agreements. So, if you look at the evolution of a free trade agreements, you can see that uh, it has become increasingly popular for artists to include the uh, provisions on services. This used to be uh, popular among mainly developed countries, but in recent years, uh, because more and more developed countries are signing free trade agreements with development countries, so many development countries are now also start to include the service-related provisions in RTAs. So uh, this include even the RTAs between uh, only development countries. So that is why that is an important issue that we have to address today. So the first issue that we will discuss today is the scheduling approach of services commitments in free trade agreements. Overall, there are two different scheduling approaches. The first one is the positive listing approach, which was the original approach for scheduling used in the WTO and also the earlier FTAs, uh, especially the pre-1995 FTAs and also the ones between development countries. It allows exceptions on market access on national treatment um, and uh, it is the traditional one that has been used. The second one is the negative listing approach, which has become uh, increasingly popular after the United States and a few other developed countries started to use it more and more often. So let's start with the traditional positive listing approach. And for this, I will use the example of uh, a WTO member, Bangladesh, is a schedule of a specific commitments. So as you can see here, this is Bangladesh's schedule on tourism and travel-related services. The subsector is a five-star hotels and loading services. And then they list their commitments according to three columns, market access, national treatment, additional commitments, and each of the commitments are listed according to one, two, three, four, which refer to the four modes of supply uh, that uh, members can supply uh, services. So, um, the uh, if you look at the WTO General Agreement on Treating Services, the agreement explicitly states that each member shall set out in a schedule the specific commitments that it undertakes under uh, Article 16 on Market Access, Article 17 on National Treatment, and Article 18 on Additional Commitments. So this means that for each WTO member, they would have an, at least one schedule, and in practice, some WTO members actually have more than one schedule because they might have improved their schedules uh, and uh, then they would add this uh, improved schedule to uh, their WTO schedule. And then uh, the schedule of commitments would be annexed to the agreement on trading services and form an integral part of this agreement. So um, with regard to uh, each sector, where the commitments are undertaken, the schedule would specify several things. The terms, limitations, and conditions on market access, so any restrictions or conditions you would want to impose uh, to provide market access to foreign service suppliers, the conditions and qualifications on national treatment, that is, any discriminatory practices against the foreign service suppliers, undertaking some additional commitments, and where appropriate, the time frame for implementation of such commitments. Sometimes, some WTO members might have a phase-in commitments. They might not uh, liberalize the whole sector immediately. Instead, this would be phasing over a period of time, uh, like 10 years or 20 years. And then uh, you also have the date of entry into force of such commitments. So these commitments in the schedule are organized by the sector and the mode of supply. Uh, for the sector, uh, the WTO actually has a, a document, the Services and Sectoral Classification List, which uh, provide a general guidance uh, 
for the classification of sectors. This uh, document uh, uh, divided all services sectors into 12 uh, uh, sectors, uh, and then uh, they are further divided into subsectors. So there are a total of 160 subsectors as identified in this document. So uh, the references uh, are also made to a UN document called the Central Product Classification Code or the CPC Code. Uh, so uh, for each of the sector, you can refer to the CPC Code as a way uh, to uh, further define this sector. But this CPC Code is only a suggested tool uh, and is not mandatory and there are some WTO members which choose to describe their sectors by using other definitions. For example, if you look at the financial services sector, there is an annex on financial services which actually listed different types of financial services and which are used by WTO members to describe their commitment in financial services. So uh, this list here gives you an example of the sectors listed in WTO. 120, as you can see, it includes business and professional services, uh, which include things such as legal services, accounting services, uh, uh, architect services, uh, and medical and dental services, and so on. Communication services, which include uh, telecommunication services, for example, construction services, distribution services, which include both retail distribution and also wholesale distribution services. Education services, which include primary education, secondary education, tertiary education, and also adult education. Environmental services, uh, financial services, which include uh, banking services, security services, insurance services, and so on. Health and social services, which include hospital services, and tourism services, which include, uh, for example, hotel services, restaurant services, recreation and cultural services, which include entertainment services, transport, uh, which include, uh, uh, for example, land transport, uh, railway transport, like um, highway transport, and also water transport, uh, 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 like inland water, and also uh, marine transport services, and the last category is a catch-all catch category of other services. So as you can see uh, from the example of business services, for the services sectoral classification list, to the left you have a description of the services subsector, and to the right you have the corresponding CPC code. Note here that the CPC code is used in the services sectoral classification list, is the CPC provisional. It is not the most recent uh, CPC, which is the CPC version uh, 2.2, I think. Uh, so you have to make sure that you refer to the CPC uh, provisional as a basis for uh, describing the type of uh, services. So as you can see, if you refer to the CPC, the CPC for each of the services sector would include a detailed explanation of the specific type of services which would help you to understand what uh, each specific services sector entails. So, uh, roughly speaking, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, scheduling approach used under the WTO General Agreement on Training and Services is the positive listing approach. But if you examine it in detail, you could also argue that uh, it is uh, a hybrid approach whereby the positive listing approach is used for uh, the inclusion of a sectors. That uh, is, uh, only the sectors which are listed in the schedule are among a member's commitments. So in other words, if you do not include a, uh, a sector in your schedule, you assume no obligation uh, on this sector in your schedule, and you only assume obligations on uh, the sectors that you have included in your schedule with regard to national treatment, market access, uh, and so on. But of course, if you look at the general agreement on trading services, uh, there are some uh, universal obligations uh, uh, which would apply regardless of whether or not you include a sector uh, in the schedule. Uh, so these include, for example, the MFN obligation, uh, 
and uh, some other good governance obligations. Now, uh, when it comes to scheduling the market access and the national treatment commitments, uh, actually uh, the method here use is the negative listing approach, which means that uh, you can only maintain the specific limitations which you have listed for a given sector and mode of supply. So, in other words, if you have not listed a specific type of a limitation uh, for, let's see, <clears throat> uh, uh, market access, then you cannot maintain such a restriction in uh, uh, with regard to your obligation on market access. And this is known as the negative listing approach. So uh, let's look at the scope and the coverage of specific commitments. So as I mentioned earlier, there are mainly three types of regulations. First is the market access obligation, which uh, applies to all measures falling under one of the six categories of market access restrictions, no matter whether they are discriminatory or not. And the second type are the national treatment type of uh, uh, restrictions, which include all other measures discriminating against the services or service suppliers of any other member. And the last one are additional commitments which are non-discriminatory measures not falling under the market access or national treatment restrictions. So let's look at them one by one. First of all, market access restrictions. So uh, these refer to uh, the restrictions and uh, one of the categories under Article 16. And uh, these restrictions are typically numerical type of restrictions. And uh, they would um, uh, apply either through a numerical uh, type of quota or through an economic needs test. So uh, if you look at the case, you are assumed to have a full market access when uh, in a given sector and mode of supply, a member does not maintain any of the six types of measures listed in uh, Article uh, 16. So now let's look at these uh, six types of um, uh, restrictions in detail. And note here that these six types of market access restrictions is an exhaustive list, uh, uh, an exhaustive list which means that uh, you only need to schedule those which are listed here for those which are not listed here uh, they are not considered as market access restrictions. First, the restrictions on number of services suppliers. For example, the government has a regulation which says the number of licenses for cosmetology schools is limited to 48 licenses. So this uh, is a limit on the number of service suppliers. Once you run out of the 48 licenses, you cannot have uh, more uh, services suppliers. And new service suppliers come in, and if they want to supply services, what can they do? Well, they can only buy the existing licenses from the existing suppliers. Second, the limitations on the value of transactions or assets. For example, there's a government regulation which restricts the total assets of a foreign banks to 25% of total bank assets. So this means that uh, the foreign banks cannot account for a large percentage of the total bank assets in order to ensure the uh, stability uh, of the financial system. And the third one is a restriction on the total number of operations or quantity of output. For example, the government might have a restriction on the broadcasting time on national TV for foreign films. So this is to make sure that the foreign films will not, uh, for example, take uh, away the screen time available for domestic made films because we want to encourage domestic production of films. The next one is the uh, restrictions on the total number of uh, natural persons. For example, we would have a restriction uh, that says you cannot uh, uh, hire uh, more than, let's say, eight uh, foreigners 
per branch of your operation. So this is to make sure that the foreigners will not take away the job opportunities available to uh, the local uh, population. Uh, the next one is the restrictions on the type of legal entity or joint venture. So uh, uh, this uh, can be done, for example, by requiring that uh, the foreign presence can only be in the uh, form of, uh, let's say, a joint venture with a local partner. So uh, this makes sure that uh, the foreign entity will not have a wholly foreign-owned uh, structure and they must have a joint venture in order to pass the technology and know-how to the local partner. And the last one is restrictions on foreign capital participation. For example, uh, the restriction which could limit the foreign equity to 49%. Uh, so this is to make sure that the foreign uh, investor will not have a majority control of the uh, uh, joint venture. So uh, these six types of restrictions are market access restrictions. As you can see, they tend to be numerical quotas or the ones which are based on an economic needs test. That is depending on whether or not the local market has such a need for uh, the uh, additional supply of these services. For national treatment type of uh, 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 restrictions, they are more of an open-ended nature. Here, uh, the requirement is that uh, the treatment to the foreign suppliers shall be no more favorable than according to the own like services and service suppliers of the uh, host country. Now, uh, this does not mean that uh, you have to provide identical treatment to uh, the uh, foreign uh, uh, service supplier because uh, depending on the situation, even if you have an identical treatment, this could result in discrimination. The easiest to spot, uh, to spot would be the de jure discrimination. For example, where uh, there's a discrimination against a foreign service supplier, seeing that the foreign service supplier cannot provide this type of uh, services. So this would be uh, openly discriminatory. But even uh, something that is um, uh, beyond that can also be uh, discriminatory. So, for example, for the de jure type of discrimination, uh, we can look at uh, the cases where the domestic supplier of audiovisual services are given preference in the allocation of frequencies within the national territory. So let's say that uh, there are a total of 10 group of uh, frequencies for uh, usage uh, by uh, the uh, suppliers of audiovisual services uh, like TV stations. And then the local ones uh, can get uh, eight frequencies, while only two frequencies are reserved for foreign suppliers. So this is an explicit discrimination on the basis of the origin of the supplier. But even short of that, you could have a de facto discrimination whereby the regulation is uh, non-discriminatory on its face, but uh, the actual effect is actually discriminatory. So here the example is a three-year period of a prior residency uh, required in order to obtain a license to supply uh, veterinary services. So here, as you can see, there is no form of distinction because the requirement, the three-year residency requirement, applies to both domestic supplier and to foreign supplier. But guess what? Foreign suppliers are much less likely to meet the requirement because imagine if you are a foreign veterinarian, uh, why would you come to this country to stay for three years uh, doing nothing so that you can supply the veterinary services three years later? This does not make much sense because you need job to survive, right? So uh, in such a case, this could be regarded as de facto discrimination. And whether or not this is uh, uh, discriminatory, uh, we would have to conduct a case-by-case -case evaluation in order to uh, determine. Note here that um, when we discuss the whether or not uh, domestic regulation is discriminatory, we also need to uh, consider uh, the uh, uh, obligations on domestic regulation under Article 6 of the guest. 
which set out the additional conditions for uh, domestic regulation under the General Agreement on Treating Services. So what are the typical national treatment limitations? Again, remember here that the gas does not include a, an exhaustive list of national treatment limitations. Instead, the uh, restrictions uh, are, are done uh, on, on an uh, abstract basis. So here, uh, let me give you a few examples. First of all, uh, there could be discriminatory subsidies and other fiscal measures. For example, you could have subsidies which are only uh, are provided to the domestic suppliers, but not to the uh, foreign suppliers. Second, there could be discriminatory nationality and residency requirements. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know the three-year residency requirement for foreign veterinary services supplier. And typically, uh, these residency requirements are associated with the mode 3. Now, uh, these four modes of supply, mode 1, 2, 3, 4, refer to the four modes which you can use to provide services. Mode 1 is uh, uh, cross-border supply. The idea is that uh, you supply the services from one country to another country. Uh, without uh, either the service uh, supplier or the service consumer crossing the border. So, for example, let's say that you are uh, a consumer, you are a patient based in Bangladesh, and you heard that uh, there's a doctor in the United States and that uh, specializes in your disease. So, uh, you call the doctor, and uh, the doctor uh, provides you with uh, some diagnosis on the phone, and this is regarded as mode 1. And uh, more two is consumption abroad. So this refers to a situation like this. Let's say that after you receive the diagnosis from the doctor, you decided that you want to seek the treatment of the doctor uh, in the United States. So you fly to the United States and you get uh, treatment uh, from the doctor in the U.S. So this is known as consumption abroad whereby the consumer cross the border, but the service supplier does not cross the border. And uh, mode 3 is uh, uh, the commercial presence, uh, which uh, means that, um, let's say, that uh, the service supplier from the U.S. decided to open a business presence in your country. Let's say a hospital from the United States uh, want to open up new hospital in your country. This would be mode 3. And mode 4 would be movement of natural persons, and in this case, uh, continue our example from earlier, the doctor would be flying to your country to treat the patient. And in this case, as you can see, uh, the service provider uh, uh, provide the service uh, uh, by crossing the border, but the service consumer do not cross the border. So most three uh, is the one most associated with the residency requirements. There could also be discriminatory licensing, registration, qualification, or training requirements. And this is uh, very common. Uh, for example, for certain types of uh, professional services, uh, for example, for legal services, uh, uh, if you look at the qualification requirement for domestically trained lawyers versus foreign lawyers, you can see a huge discrepancy. For the domestic lawyers, so long as you finish law school and pass the bar exam, you can start with virtually no practical experience. Uh, but for the uh, uh, foreign lawyers, typically most countries would require the foreign lawyers to practice in their country to have a, a, a rich experience. Let's say uh, for 10 years of post-qualification experience or in some countries requiring even 20 years or 25 years. And as you can see, this is discriminatory. And in the sense that uh, domestic lawyers uh, do not require such rich history to practice. And the uh, rationale here is that uh, the foreign uh, service suppliers come in uh, and we would want only the best foreign service suppliers come in because if you have a new foreign lawyer that just qualified comes in, they are not going to provide good legal services. And if something goes wrong, uh, they might run away, uh, you might not be able to uh, successfully discipline them. And But the same uh, rationale does not apply to the domestic service supplier. That's why you have a different uh, uh, 
uh, requirements for domestic versus foreign service supplier. And another uh, limitation is on um, technology transfer requirements. So uh, here, um, uh, some countries would require the foreign service suppliers when they come in to transfer their technology to the local partner in order to uh, help the local partner to gain the know-how and technology. Another common limitation on national treatment is the prohibition on land uh, or property ownership. So, for example, in Singapore, if you are a foreigner, you can only buy uh, the apartments, uh, but you cannot buy landed property because landed property is only reserved for local citizens. And the rationale here is that uh, land is a scarce resources and also land is a physical part of a country, so we want to make sure that the only people who can own land are the locals rather than the foreigners, because otherwise the foreigners can come in, buy a lot of land, and the local people would not have land to build houses on, and this would cause social problems. And the last limit type of a limitation would be limitation on insurance portability or education grants. So this is also restricts the availability of services for given sectors. For example, insurance portability. If you want to seek treatment for a disease in domestic hospital, then uh, uh, most likely you will be able to claim from the insurance you buy. But if you want to seek treatment in foreign, uh, uh, in foreign hospitals, then uh, the insurance program of many countries will not allow you to claim the insurance uh, from all this uh, foreign treatment, uh, and uh, that uh, apparently restrict the ability of the foreign hospitals to provide these type of services uh, to uh, you. And same is true for education grants. The government might subsidize uh, your education when you choose to go to universities uh, domestically, but when you go to foreign universities, you might not be able to enjoy such a subsidy, and this will also limit the ability of the foreign uh, educational services provider to provide educational services. So these are the typical examples of a national treatment uh, type of uh, limitations. There could be cases whereby uh, there is uh, an overlap between market access and national treatment uh, limitations. For example, where you have a discriminatory quota or equity ceiling uh, based on the origin of the service supplier. So in such a case, first of all, it is a numerical quota, so it is a market access restriction. And second, because it is also discriminatory, so it is also a national treatment restriction. So in such a case, according to the guess, uh, it should be inscribed in the column relating to market access restrictions. That is the first column. And this would be understood to provide uh, a condition and qualification on national treatment as well. And you do not need to list the same restrictions for the national treatment column again, but this would be understood to apply to both types of uh, restrictions. And in terms of scheduling uh, and uh, the guess, uh, there are different uh, terminologies uh, used to indicate different uh, levels of uh, commitments. So uh, you can have a range of uh, commitments ranging from full commitment, that is uh, uh, fully open the sector, where you would put in the word none, which means no limitation, okay? On the other hand, you could decide to not have any commitment for the scheduled sector, where you would put in unbound, that means not bound by any commitments, okay? But in between, uh, you can have uh, commitments with the uh, corresponding limitations, indicating the elements inconsistent with either the market access obligation or the national treatment obligation. So uh, you could simply uh, just inscribe your limitations in your schedule and this would be uh, understood uh, accordingly. Now, uh, uh, there is also an interesting case where in some of the schedules you will see unbound with an asterisk. This means that uh, uh, the uh, uh, measure, uh, the uh, commitment is uh, unbound because of the lack of a technical feasibility. For example, hair cutting services. Uh, 
nowadays can only be provided uh, in uh, mode 3 or mode 4 where the consumer uh, uh, and the um, uh, service supplier uh, are together. It cannot be provided, for example, through mode 1 where the consumer and the supplier are based in different countries. So for mode 1, you might see uh, N-bound with an asterisk, which means that uh, it is N-bound due to lack of a technical feasibility. So this is summed up the negative listing approach, uh, sorry, the positive listing approach and the guess, which uh, is a still an influential uh, scheduling approach that is used in many RTAs, especially the ones between developed countries. On the other hand, there is also the negative listing approach, uh, which has been pioneered by the United States and used in the later uh, FTAs. Now, the negative listing approach would allow exceptions on market access, national treatment, local presence, performance requirements, and local residency and nationality, uh, and so on. So, for the negative listing approach, as I mentioned earlier, the presumption is that you would um, uh, open up all sectors except those sectors where you explicitly include limitations or restrictions. So uh, for negative listing approach, unlike the WTO, for the WTO guess you have a schedule which lists the specific sectors and subsectors that you want to uh, uh, include commitments. But for the negative listing approach, because the default rule is uh, full commitment, so you only list the exceptions to uh, the market liberalization. And the exceptions would come in two ways. Uh, the first one is known as non-conforming measures. So these are the type of restrictions that you currently maintain and you would like to uh, uh, retain for the future. So for example, uh, here you can see that uh, there's a non-conforming measure in Singapore's schedule for financial services. Here, you need to first list the sector and subsector, and for this case, the sector is the financial services, while the subsector is the banking services. And you also need to list the obligation uh, this type of non conforming measures uh, is deviating from. So, the obligation concern is the market access obligation. So, this is uh, a limitation on market access. And the level of government is also listed here. For Singapore, there's only one level of government, that is national government. But for some WTO members like the United States, which have a federal system, the level of government could be the federal level or the state level, depending on the situation. And you also need to uh, uh, list the uh, specific measure that is in place. So the measure in this case uh, refer to the domestic legislation, which provide the basis for this restriction, and in this case, it is the Finance Companies Act. And then you need to list the reservation in detail. And here, as you can see, it states that uh, no new finance company licenses will be granted. So uh, um, uh, this uh, means that uh, there will be no more licenses. And a finance company may only establish a Singapore incorporated, uh, com as Singapore incorporated companies. So you can only uh, use a locally incorporated legal entity rather than as a subsidiary of a foreign uh, entity, and so on. So this is an example of non-conforming measures. The second type is reservations. Now, the difference between non-conforming measures and reservations is that the non-conforming measures refer to the existing measures which uh, do not conform with one of your obligations such as market access or national treatment. But the reservations is the sectors where you want to reserve the uh, uh, ability to introduce more restrictions in the future. So you uh, might not currently have restrictions, but you include if you include this in your list of reservations in the future, you can still introduce more uh, restrictions. So here the example again is uh, banking services and the financial services. The obligation concern is both market access and national treatment. The level of government is uh, at the national level. The measure concerns the Banking Act and also MAS, uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore Notice 619. Uh, 
So here uh, it states that Singapore reserves the right to adopt or maintain any measures affecting the supply of services by foreign banks with qualifying full bank privilege, save that any such measure shall not decrease the qualifying foreign bank privileges in respect of the supply of services enjoined by foreign banks with qualifying bank privileges as of the date of entry into force of this agreement. So this means that for new banks, foreign banks with qualifying full bank privileges, uh, we might adopt uh, certain restrictions that affect uh, their supply of services. So as you can see, uh, this focus on future uh, restrictions. Another interesting feature of the uh, 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 RTAs on services is the uh, inclusion of so-called locking mechanism. So what are the locking mechanisms? They can be one of the two type of provisions. The first one is a standstill uh, provision, uh, which basically means that uh, once you enter into this RTA, then all of your existing liberalizations uh, that were introduced by a certain date, uh, typically the time of uh, entry into force of the uh, RTA, uh, would be kept, which means that you cannot uh, retract your uh, liberalization. You can only improve your liberalization, but you cannot uh, retract your liberalization uh, to a more restrictive level. So this is to prevent backtracking uh, of the commitments. The second type are the ratchet provisions. So ratchet provisions uh, applies to uh, future uh, uh, liberalizations. So this means that uh, if, let's say, um, uh, you decide to liberalize this sector for the future, if, let's say, previously you do not allow foreign banks to conduct, let's say, uh, um, uh, deposit-taking business, but five years from now you allow foreign banks to uh, conduct a deposit-taking uh, uh, business, uh, and uh, once you decide to liberalize, if you have a ratchet provision, in your uh, RT, which applies to financial services, uh, then uh, you cannot uh, remove uh, this liberalization. You can only make it more liberal. You cannot make it more restrictive in the future. So uh, once the future liberalization is in place, it is ratcheted up and you cannot go back to the restrictions uh, before. So again, this is to pre prevent the backtrack, uh, backtracking of liberalization. In terms of the structure of the agreement, uh, now um, uh, different agreements uh, takes different uh, uh, um, takes the different uh, approaches, as we can see uh, from the study. So, some of the agreement uh, cover all four modes of supply in a self-contained chapter. Uh, so, uh, this is a, a unified approach. But some uh, agreement uh, include, in addition to the self-contained chapter, also additional chapter on investment. Now, investment is closely related to services because investment is essentially most three of the services, uh, commercial presence. And uh, this seems to be the most popular uh, approach for the uh, RTS adopting a positive listing approach. Uh, but for the RTS adopting a negative listing approach, uh, they would include, in addition uh, to the chapter on investment, they also include another chapter on movement of natural persons, that is the mode 4, which is also an interesting issue. Uh, and uh, then uh, there are other uh, types of um, uh, approaches, for example, this is quite rare, uh, where you would have chapter on cross-border trading services, uh, that is a mode 1 and mode 2 plus an investment chapter and plus in chapter on movement of persons. So basically each mode of supply get their own chapter. Okay. Uh, then on uh, market access and national treatment uh, related issues, again uh, there's a, a divergence in approaches. For example, uh, if you look at the uh, market access uh, type of uh, uh, restrictions, as you can see, um, some of the uh, RTEs prohibit uh, local presence uh, requirements. And this is especially true for the ones uh, 
uh, adopting negative leasing approaches. And such agreements also include provisions on export-related performance, uh, local content requirements, uh, performance requirements, technology transfer, and nationality requirements uh, for board of directors or senior management. Uh, so as you can see, uh, this is very popular for negative listing uh, approaches. Why? Because the negative listing FTEs are typically concluded by the developed countries. And these are really the key issues the developed countries wanted to address in their FTEs, uh, especially with the developed countries, because many developed countries, for example, have a local content or local presence requirements or have a performance requirements and this restrict the ability of foreign investors to take full advantage uh, of the um, market access commitments. And some FTEs also have provisions relating to monopolies, uh, additional commitments, and also gradual liberalization. And again, as you can see here, uh, for these provisions, uh, and typically is the negative leasing uh, approach uh, FTEs which would contain these provisions. Some RTEs also include provisions on uh, domestic regulation. So for domestic regulation, um, this would be provisions relating to qualification, licensing, and technical standards. And domestic regulation is uh, something that WTO members are also discussing. And um, uh, as you can see here for services, it is very hard for you to regulate them uh, in the form of border measures like tariffs. Instead, most of the service regulations would take the form of a domestic regulation. So that is why a domestic regulation is such a big issue in free trade agreements. Another issue also related to domestic regulations is good governance type of provisions, which basically specifies, for example, uh, on the need uh, to uh, 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 provide a uh, common uh, opportunity for uh, the service suppliers affected by re uh, regulation uh, on the need to administer the laws and regulation in a reasonable, objective, and impartial manner, and also uh, to make decisions regarding the approval of licenses or granting of licenses uh, on, uh, within a reasonable period of time, and also to inform the applicants the, statu uh, the status of uh, applications. All of these, again, are key issues that developed country uh, service suppliers will run into when they try to provide services uh, in a developed country. That is why you see them addressed in all these FTEs on services. Another types of uh, provisions relate to mutual recognition agreements. So for mutual recognition agreements, uh, here, uh, uh, the idea is that um, the um, uh, service regulating authorities of one country will recognize the qualifications uh, by the uh, authorities from another country so that uh, the service suppliers from the other country, once they obtain the regulation in such a country, can then provide the uh, services in the first country. And this is typically limited in specified sectors. For example, for legal sectors, Singapore in some of its FTAs recognize the qualifications uh, uh, of law degrees uh, from some countries, typically common law countries like the US or UK and Australia, but not other countries. And this greatly enhance the ability of these service suppliers to provide services across jurisdictions. Another type is transparency type of obligations. Again, this is related to domestic regulation because here, um, for many service suppliers, a key problem for them is to obtain access to the relevant regulations on a given sector. And uh, if they cannot have the, uh, uh, the relevant regulations, they will not understand what are the requirements to providing services. Some uh, RTEs also include provisions on services safeguards. Now, safeguard uh, is a, a concept that was borrowed from the GET. So if you recall from the GET, safeguard measures are the uh, measures that you can adopt on a temporary uh, basis in order to deal with the sudden increase of imports uh, from abroad. Now, some development countries worry that they might run into the same problem if they open up their service market, that is why uh, 
uh, the uh, advocating for the inclusion of safeguard mechanisms uh, in the uh, trade agreements. Uh, in the WTO, uh, there is no discipline on safeguard measures for services, so this is currently at a negotiation. Uh, and uh, 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 the WTO members have not been able to reach any agreement on this yet, but in some of the RTs, they already started to include such uh, uh, provision. Last type of measures are the measures relating to exceptions. So for exceptions, there are two types of exceptions. The first are the general exceptions, so the um, measures which you, you know, undertake in order to protect the human, animal, plant life or health, to protect the exhaustible natural resources, to protect uh, public moral, to protect the environment, and so on. So this is uh, quite popular in both positive listing and negative listing FTAs. And uh, the second type of exceptions are what we will call security ex exceptions. So these are the exceptions which uh, uh, you can take for security reasons. For example, in a time of a war, uh, and also to deal with uh, uh, trading weapons and so on. So uh, this is the second type of exceptions that you can undertake. So uh, this concludes our session on service provisions, which as you can see listed uh, a series of different types of service related provisions in the RTS. And I hope that we it will be of some use to you. Uh, and uh, I will conclude here. Thank you so much.